Good evening, everyone. I am Gary Witherspoon, Deputy Project Director for Public Outreach for the Purple Line. On behalf of Governor Larry Hogan, Transportation Secretary Gregory Slater, and Maryland Transit Administration Administrator Kevin Quinn, welcome to the seventh Community Advisory Committee meeting for Greater Littonsville Woodside. Due to COVID restrictions, we are trying a new format this time out. Please bear with us as this is our first live public meeting. And please mute your phones and microphones. Next slide, please. Tonight we'll cover the segment of the Purple Line that includes the Littonsville and the 16th Street Woodside stations. Quite an important segment of the corridor. Next slide, please. You'll receive a project update from Matt Pollock and Vern Hartsock, the new leaders of the MDOT MTA Office of Transit Development and Delivery which oversees the project. For those of you who didn't know, they replaced Chuck Latuka and Jeff Enzer. Matt and Vern will introduce themselves and fill you in on what's happening with the project. After their introductions, we'll update you on construction and tell you how the MDOT MTA plans to manage construction. We'll provide an update on the art and transit component of the project, and we'll tell you where to submit questions beyond those that will be addressed tonight. This evening's presentation is being recorded, so you will be able to find it later on our website, purplelinemd.com. That's purplelinemd.com. Along with responses to questions we could either not answer or could not get to tonight. We ask that you hold your questions until after the presentation. Then we will open the meeting to questions first from CAP members and elected officials. That also includes county representatives. We'll invite you to raise your hand. This app does not have a wave your hand option, so you'll have to physically wave so that I can see you. Then you will be acknowledged and you should unmute yourself by pressing control shift M as in mute. That's control shift M as in mute. That's if you don't have a microphone. Non cat members who are viewing the meeting and have questions can ask them can ask questions themselves using the Q and A function. It's on your screen. Time permitting. We will address your questions. Just tap on the question mark icon. All questions will be addressed later in a question and response posting on the website. Similar questions will be combined, so you may not see your question posted verbatim. Thank you for joining the meeting. Here's Matt Pollock. Good evening. I'm Matt Pollock, Executive Director for Transit Development and Delivery for MDOT MTA and I am responsible for the Purple Line project. Uh, this, is no, this is by no means my first light rail project. I've been involved in light rail projects since the early 1990s. My experience includes light rail startup and expansion projects in St. Louis, Pittsburgh, London, and Charlotte, to name a few. However, without a doubt, being able to join the Purple Line project here in my home state is a real source of pride. Going back a century, I grew up in the White Oak area of Montgomery County, and now I live in Prince George's County. I'm honored to be on the job and here to take the project to completion. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Vern Hartsock, our acting project director. Uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, good evening, everyone. Again, I'm Vern Hartsock, acting project director. Uh, a little about me, uh, I've served with the MTA for over 28 years. I've been working on the Purple Line for just over eight months. Prior to that, I was MTA's chief engineer. And prior to MTA, 
I worked in the private sector for 10 years in a variety of technical positions and I taught college. I'm a software engineer by training and have successfully delivered many transit construction projects for light rail, for Metro subway, for bus, and I'm a Baltimore native. Uh, I'm extremely excited to be part of the uh, delivery team uh, for the Purple Line, and I'll pass back to Matt now for a project update. Thank you. Thank you, Vern. We'll go straight to the next slide. While most of you are probably up to date regarding the events of the past couple months, I do want to back up briefly. In the May and June time frame, uh, the concessionaire, PLTP, and the design build contractor, PLTC, both sent in notices of termination for extended delay. The state disputes the validity of an extended delay as defined in the P3 agreement and sought to keep both PLTP and PLTC on the project. A temporary restraining order kept PLTP and PLTC on the project through August. However, uh, in September, the Baltimore Circuit Court ruled that both PLTP and PLTC could leave the project without going through the dispute resolution process. While the design build contractor has fully demobilized from the project, the concessionaire, PLTP, is still trying to find a way to continue its relationship with the state and the Purple Line project. This is how we find ourselves on a parallel path. We continue to negotiate with the concessionaire and hope to reach a fair and, and reasonable settlement. At the same time, the state and my team is implementing a plan to deliver the Purple Line without PLTP and PLTC. At the end of October, MDOT MTA officially took over the day-to-day -to -day management of the Purple Line project by taking assignment of PLTPs and PLTC's subcontracts. These subcontracts include the light rail vehicle manufacturer, the operations and maintenance contractor, dozens of purchase orders, and all of the construction firms working under PLTC. With the new team of available MDOT MTA contractors, we commenced the management of construction activities. Vern will provide details of this in just a couple of slides. Next slide, please. In addition to the primary work under the P3 agreement, there are other Purple Line construction activities that have been underway and will continue. These activities include the Polk Street Maintenance Facility in Prince George's County and some of the environmental projects at Kengar Park and within the Paint Branch Stream. Next slide, please. I want to mention a few other items related to the overall project status now. PLTC's departure from the project has presented some complexities associated with the resumption of construction, primarily because 30% of the work was performed by PLTC itself. This creates scope gaps that need to be addressed through coordination with the remaining contractors. Equally important, it potentially creates capability gaps, whereby certain construction services may not be available through the remaining contractors. A primary example of this situation is blasting, which requires specialized staff and permits. As we continue our discussions with contractors about resuming work on the project, we're looking to integrate the firms into teams that can complete the work in the field. We're also identifying activities that will remain incomplete until a new design build contractor is on board. To the extent possible, we respectfully request your patience as we navigate through these complexities. Project funding, on the other hand, while evolving, is in place and available. The Purple Line will continue to move forward with funding from the Transportation Trust Fund. Transportation Trust Fund allows us to keep the project moving forward in the short term while the long-term financing options are evaluated. The long-term plan encompassing funding, procurement, and a schedule remains under development. The state intends to have a concessionaire and a new design build contractor ultimately take the project through construction and into operations and maintenance. And along the way, MDOT and MDOT MTA want to facilitate success through ongoing dialogues with all of you, the community, residents, 
and businesses impacted by the Purple Line. We are trying very hard to minimize confusion, and we hope that you will continue to see this as a collaborative effort. Next slide, please. With that, I will pass to Vern to discuss MDOT MTA's management of construction. Uh, thank you, Matt. Um, next slide, please. Now, during October and November, MDOT MTA and the contractors that we now have directly working for us have been working together to continue several very important aspects of the construction. This includes the off-site manufacturing of light rail vehicles, which is taking place in Elmira, New York and Spain, as well as other key project components, such as the traction power substations, the railway signaling instrument houses and other electrical components that are being fabricated, as well as completing the final construction designs for stormwater management systems and intelligent transportation systems throughout the corridor. Next slide, please. Now, starting with a select few locations, MDOT MTA is directing the resumption of on-site construction along the alignment. And as the contractors come online, this activity will increase exponentially uh, week by week. To give a, uh, a snapshot of some of the contractors that are working for us now, uh, we have a small list here, including Pessoa Construction Company, who is performing water and sewer re re utility relocations and concrete work. In fact, on social media, Pessoa was just featured in a, in a nice interview discussing how all their men and equipment are back on the job. Henkels and McCoy will be performing gas and overhead power relocation work. MC Dean will be performing systems and electrical work, and Empire Landscaping is performing system-wide erosion and sediment control services, and they're also maintaining the grounds around the new M at the University of Maryland, as well as traffic engineering services who are performing maintenance of traffic support. Next slide, please. Now, to discuss our near-term and long-term construction activities, our near-term uh, items consist of things in the next six months, which consist of water main relocations and retaining walls. In fact, there's, there's hundreds of walls across the alignment that are part of the project, and it's our intention to uh, further and complete those as a part of the activities in the, in the next six months and beyond. Now, for our longer term, which is six to 12 months, uh, the activities that we have planned include utility relocations throughout the corridor, because if we are able to remove the utility obstacles in the path of the continued construction, then we make the project a lot more attractive to the next concessionaire who can come in and literally lay track and, and complete the construction. So those utility relocations are critical to, uh, to the project. As well as crash wall construction, crash walls occur wherever our alignment is closely adjacent to another railway for safety purposes. As well as we have plans to construct the Talbot Avenue Bridge and also to work on the Littonsville uh, Place Bridge. And with that, I'd like to uh, pass to Gary Witherspoon for an update on construction reminders and an update on art and transit. Thank you. Gary, are you on mute? Apologies, I was on mute. You should know that existing traffic patterns will change as work occurs as needed. Work may occur on both sides of the road and crossways, crossroads. When a lane closure is required, 
a notice will be distributed via text and email, but you have to sign up through purplelinemd.com. Again, that's purplelinemd.com. On your road, you'll also see orange cones and barrels. They may serve as temporary barricades, but they will be in place. You should also watch out for workers, including flag people. They'll be used when required to direct traffic. And underground utility work may require temporary road closures. Next slide, please. Again, you can sign up for construction notices at purplelinemd.com. For project questions and comments, contact the MDOT MTA outreach team at outreach at purplelinemd.com. Again, that's outreach at purplelinemd.com. We also have several phone numbers. You can call 443-451-3706 or for Spanish, 443-451-3705. Those lines are not managed or manned around the clock, but we are working on manning an emergency hotline so someone will be available to take your calls. Next slide, please. Art in transit. Next slide. We want you to know that the art in transit program is intact. We are meeting with and talking to artists weekly. They have been made fully aware of the project status. Almost all of their contracts have been completed and they are now being fully managed by MDOT MTA. Half of the fully executed contracts are in Montgomery County and you can see the artists rendering on the project website, purplelinemd.com. Again, that's purplelinemd.com. You can also check us out on social media. Next slide, oh, excuse me. We expect installations of art to occur as designed in the later stage in the latter stages of construction. This concludes our main presentation. Before we open up the meeting to live questions, Matt and Vern will address those that came in before the meeting. Matt. Thank you, Gary. OK, we received, um, I think it was seven questions. So first question, do you expect any portions of the project design to change now that the P3 agreement has ended? The status of the P3 agreement is in dispute and is part of the pending litigation. However, regardless of that litigation, the purple line does not expect any designs to change. The next question, is it possible to accelerate completion of certain infrastructure in and around the project that is disruptive to the community, such as the Talbot Avenue Bridge? The state is evaluating construction across the alignment, including areas of local community priority. MTA is actively working with design, construction and manufacturing contractors to keep the project moving forward. Our focus is on completing the design, permitting and any unfinished work. First with paving, stormwater drainage and other utility projects now underway along the Purple Line Corridor. We remain committed to continue working with the community and local businesses to collaborate and find opportunities to minimize any impacts to the best of our ability. If the state is able to reasonably advance work beyond utilities using the available pool of contractors, the state will do so. Uh, next question. What new general timelines can we expect for completion of various aspects of the project from what PLTC planned. The state will manage purple line construction until the new design build contractor is on board. We do not have a new timeline yet. Next slide, please. 
And question number four. Is there a contingency plan for if funding runs out to finish the project? How would the work sites be closed down and restored so they don't remain an open sore for our community? The state fully intends to finish the Purple Line project. Question number five. What is the prospect for seeking additional federal assistance should there be a change in executive leadership at the federal level? The federal participation in the Purple Line project includes the uh, $900 million full funding grant agreement and access to the TIFIA loans. TIFIA is uh, Transportation Infrastructure Finance and Innovation Act. The state is not anticipating additional federal assistance for the Purple Line project. Next slide, please. Question six. What is the agreement with the school system regarding construction during the school year? The Purple Line project has construction activities near to Rosemary Hills Elementary School and Silver Spring International Middle School. The Purple Line will not conduct loud, disruptive construction activities while students are at school. And question number seven. Will the Talbot Avenue Bridge closing and the Spring Street Bridge closing overlap? As you know, if they do overlap, this will make it very difficult for people to attend religious services. What steps are you taking to avoid this problem? The Purple Line Project does not intend for the Spring Street Bridge to be closed while the Talbot Avenue Bridge is closed. So at, at this point, it's really time for, for us to listen to you, um, the CAT members or, or the public, and, and hear your thoughts about the Purple Line in your community. Um, next slide, please. Yes, we'd like to invite you to ask questions. Please raise your hands and wave so that I know to call on you, and then you can fire away. Those who are attending as attendees, please send questions. Tap on your question mark and we will acknowledge you. I see that uh, Karen Hendricks is is watching, representing U.S. Senator Chris Van Hollen. Karen, do you have any questions? Fire away. Well, if I might make a suggestion while people are perhaps thinking about questions and, and whether to type them up, um, we do have uh, Montgomery County DOT represented with us here today uh, with Maricela. And um, if it's okay, perhaps Maricela could present some, some thoughts on the Purple Line from, from the point of view of Montgomery County and the DOT. Sure, thank you, Matt. So um, it's good to be here again. We just met during the walkthrough with with some of this group, and uh, and that was a, a really good event that we just had on Saturday. Um, I'm glad to be here again today. Um, I can answer any questions as well. I think I think my our the county's position is that we um, remain committed to the project. I have not stopped working. On the contrary, I'm working even harder these days. <laughs> so, um, you know, construction and design for us continues. Uh, we have been focusing a lot more on safety, maintenance of traffic and access issues. Of course, we need to make sure that the project sites remain safe for everyone. Um, there are some maintenance, issue, maintenance issues that we've been dealing with as well. Um, I'm still the point of contact for the project, so anyone who needs anything on the county side can feel free to reach out to me. I think most of this group knows where to find me, but um, I'll be glad to share my information if someone wants it. And uh, 
I just want to thank MTA as well for the partnership and the collaboration that that we've had in the past few months. It's been very difficult for everyone, of course, uh, and and it's busy and we have a lot of work to get done so that the project continues and uh, and we appreciate the the work we're doing together to accomplish this with as minimum disruptions and as fast as possible. With that, if anyone has any questions for me, I'll be glad to answer them. Thank you, Marcella. Thank you, Marcella. We do have a question. Uh, this is from Kate Morganoff. She says, this is both a question and a topic we would like to put on the team's radar. Is there any coordination collaboration with CSX, Mark, and other rail services to determine and control noise levels once the purple line is operational? Trains generally sound their horns at least six times when approaching rail crossings and stations. Will the same hold for the Littonsville Purple Line station? Currently, there is not much noise from train horns, but we are concerned that this will change once there's a new station. There are many homes with windows directly facing the tracks. Well, thank you. Thank you for that question. And um, what I will be doing in a second is, is passing it along to Vern because I know uh, Vern has been has been involved in this in the past, but but I do want you to know that we are definitely uh, coordinating uh, with CSX. We do have monthly meetings with CSX uh, and and are working through numerous um, issues as it relates to both the the Littonsville corridor and you know uh, continuing along towards 16th Street as well. And actually, Maricel is a part of those meetings as well. Certainly, uh, interface with Mark is is a little bit easier because we're all part of part of the MTA, but but yes, that coordination is going on as well. So with that, I'll pass it to Vern if he has um, thoughts with respect to the uh, the the train and the horns. Uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, yes, there is um, sort of a, uh, the issue is safety involving highway rail intersections. The uh, Federal Railroad Administration prescribes the 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 level of activity regarding the sounding of the horn of the train. It's two longs, uh, a short and a long sounding of the horn and at a sound level of 90 decibels. Now, that's uh, for a that's a standard practice in the railroad business. However, we have been able to uh, work with certain grade crossings, uh, for example, in the Baltimore Central light rail line to have some uh, alternative approaches in, in certain cases to this application of the sounding of the horn. And when we are in getting into the operations and startup of the purple line, we'll examine every opportunity to address the the noise issues and the and the procedure for how the horns will be sounded at the great crossings uh, that traverse uh, communities uh, such as Littonsville. So uh, we we will certainly focus upon that, but please uh, consider that the the sounding of the horn in general is a safety measure because the um, uh, although these great crossings, for example, the one right there in Lintonsville will be an automatic gated crossing with 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 warning lights and a bell. Uh, every measure of safety has to be employed to protect uh, the, the public uh, from moving trains, but we will work to minimize these impacts to to as much as degree as possible uh, while maintaining safety. Thank you. All right, the next question is from Ralph Bennett from Purple Line Now. He says there, are, there there's a new short third track in the CSX right of way from the Talbot Avenue Bridge to Brookville R R Road Bridge. What's that about? Very good question. So that is uh, a storage track that has been constructed to allow uh, the CSX to, to have uh, the flexibility for their operations. Um, it allows them to, if there is uh, some sort of a maintenance concern and they need to get a, a train off the main line, that they can move it into this storage track. And it was put together and included in the Purple Line project as part of the ongoing, uh, or I should say, the original design and negotiations with the CSX. All right, our next question comes from Julie Lees.
she asked about the the trajectory of the Talbot Avenue Bridge. That's the entire question. OK, the Talbot Avenue Bridge is significantly elevated from the adjacent street on the north side of the bridge. Can somewhat someone comment on the construction changes that will be needed on the street to manage drainage and smooth the drop off from the vi from the bridge for vehicles? Yeah, OK, absolutely. That's a that's a really good question. And, and it, it's interesting, you know, we were just out there on on Halloween um, and and, you know, when you look from um, from the road from Talbot Avenue and you're looking at the bridge, it it you have to wonder where it's coming down. But but I, I promise you that the, the design is in place and, and the design is progressing and the construction is progressing very well. Um, this bridge actually is going to have a reduced angle. Um, so it's going to be a less sharp turn for cars coming off the bridge than it was previously, and and it will it will connect down to the street to the street level. Uh, but there has to be a lot of walls built before that can happen. There are retaining walls that have to go on on both both sides of the road, and then once those retaining walls are in, we have to build the road up in order to to meet the bridge, and so. That has to take place before we can do that. And actually, before we can even start on those walls, we have to um, still move some some power poles. Uh, there's one pole in particular that you can see sort of paralleling the bridge there. And we we still have some water relo water utility relocations that have to take place as well. But uh, it is as designed and the road will meet the bridge. Other questions, other questions, fire mm -hmm. away. And if you think of questions later, you can send them for the next week to outreach at purplelinemd.com. That's outreach at purplelinemd.com. We'll accept questions from this cat group until the end, the close of November 12th. Are there other questions? <laughs> well, fortunately, a lot of things, uh, uh, issues were addressed uh, during our uh, walk through the neighborhood last weekend. And uh, we're certainly grateful to the community and to uh, Matt and Vern and Kevin Ober Oberheim for being available to meet the community and, uh, and address their concerns. All right, I'm going to turn, turn it back over to Matt to wrap us up. Oh, 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 oh sorry, a question just came in. Here we go. Uh, from about the Barrington Apartments. Due to the trees being cut down, uh, property experienced damages. Uh, for, uh, mud sliding into pool and a violation due to light spillage into a nearby community. Who is the best person to reach out to for assistance? Well, I could answer that, but Gary, you know I'm going to turn it right back to you to answer that question, so I will let you take that one. Yes, please uh, send me an email. It's gwitherspoon1 at mdot.maryland.gov, or you can send an email to the outreach at purplelinemd.com, and we'll look into the matter for you. Outreach at purplelinemd.com. OK, here's another question from Julie Lees. Will the walls be above the road on the track side? How will water drainage work for the homeowners on 4th Avenue where their property adjoins the road? 
Okay. Um, I think I understand your question, and, and certainly I, I don't have all the details of, of how the, the storm drains are working, but, but typically um, all, of our, all of our designs uh, will flow the water towards drains and then drain it away. So I mean, there are no uh, designs that do not account for the impervious surface and that keep uh, water just like draining without any direction. Um, certainly, if if you want the details of that stormwater design, you know, we can uh, we can have conversations or we can either, you know, share some drawings with you if you have specific questions. OK, next question. Will the stormwater connection be beneath the CSS track, CSX tracks near Ballard be completed anytime soon? Well, I'd love to give you an answer, but I don't have one at this time for that question. That, that question um, is a little too deep for me. Um, we will happy be happy to get you an answer and, and respond in writing as part of our response to this CAP meeting. All right, here's a, a question from a, a Montgomery Blair High School student. It says many students use their student IDs to get free rides on ride on buses. Does the same policy apply for the light rail contained within the Purple Line system? Mm, that is a good question. To my knowledge, we have not determined the, the fair policy yet for the Purple Line or, or what the, uh, the manner for the reduced, um, reduced fares are going to be. I think we're probably going to know that as we get closer, probably within within one year of starting revenue service. But at this time, unfortunately, we don't have an answer to that. But thank you for asking. Let's see if we got anything else. Are there any other questions? Are there any other questions? Seeing, oh, here we go. This one said the last question was, was referring to the impact of deforestation on Park Sutton. Uh, I followed up with a county code enforcer regarding a couple dozen floodlights from Barrington shining into our windows. He was in contact briefly, then stopped responding to my emails and calls. It's like daylight after dark on dozens of units. I can send a picture to il illustrate the point. Well, first of all, thanks for bringing us bringing this to uh, our attention. Um, it's important. That that we know when issues like that are coming up, um, it's I guess the it, it the question is really two parts. There's a question about um, trees being removed, and then there's a question about uh, lights. Um, now, as far as the trees being removed, you know, certainly trees were required to be removed in order to take the alignment um, through the area, uh, and you know while. We are, you know, never happy to remove a tree. Uh, we, we did it in accordance with the, the environmental compliance and, and all of the uh, codes. And we do have reforestation um, as part of the overall project. Uh, it may not uh, re result in one for one tree replacement, unfortunately. Now, the second question with respect to floodlights, um, 
I guess it really will depend upon the source of the lights. Um, if these are if these are lights that are are caused by our construction activities, then absolutely we want to know about it, and we want to mitigate it uh, right away to the extent that we can. If there are if these lights are being caused by um, equipment outside of the purple line, certainly let us know, and and we'll try and see if we can't coordinate to get you some help. Um, but I, I would not know exactly whether we can uh, address it directly. Okay, are there other questions? Well, as a reminder, you have another week to, to send us questions. You can send them to outreach at purplelinemd.com. That's outreach at purplelinemd.com. And they'll be addressed in a Q&R format on the website. I thought I muted my phone. <laughs> We apologize for those who had te technical difficulties uh, watching us tonight. This is our first time out, so please bear with us. Other questions? We've got a statement of gratitude from Ralph Bennett. Thank you for staying in touch with us. <laughs> Thank you, Ralph. And, uh, and the, the community has been very uh, uh, vocal about their uh, their appreciation of of Matt and Vern's accessibility and availability, and that is something they will continue to do. Okay. Other questions, again, can be sent to outreach at purplelinemd.com, outreach at purplelinemd.com until November 12th, and they will be posted online. All right, that concludes our CAP presentation for Greater Littonsville Woodside. Again, we apologize for any technical difficulties, and please send us questions. Matt? Yeah, absolutely. I, I just want to thank everybody for attending today, and I want to thank you for your continued interest and input on the Purple Line project. Uh, we really do appreciate it. Uh, we need to have the eyes and ears from the community to, to know what the priorities are, because, you know, in, in many cases, your input will help shape how we proceed. And so it's very important um, that we hear from you, both, uh, you know, the good and the bad and uh, we appreciate it. So thank you very much and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Good night, everybody. <laughs>